So it's been two weeks since the last episode, which is uh, interesting because of course that naturally means a lot of people are going to kind of have higher expectations just because more time has passed. And I think that's a little unfair. I didn't really feel like that going into it, but I feel like because of that episode four is definitely going to have a lot more opinions surrounding it than usual. Let's just say that. Uh, another factor that kind of contributes to that is no card fight this week, which I'm okay with, honestly. I mean, that's the thing. Ever since I found out that this show was basically going to be good, you know, ever since I saw that first episode and really enjoyed it, ever since then I've kind of gone into each episode with just the expectation of give me more of the show I like, and episode 4 gave me more of the show I liked. Obviously, there's a lot to get into here, uh, this episode was very much, like, I feel like it was foreshadowing based, you know? I feel like a lot of it was setting up things for the future and kind of taking a deeper look as to who Team Blackout really are, you know? Uh, obviously, because of that, this is the most character-focused episode we've had yet. This was very much focused on the various different characters of this series and kind of what's been going on with them and like I said no card fight in fact the only really time we see the cards at all in this episode is this scene here with uh, Yu Yu looking at his deck in school other than that this very much is the most like this is the closest the Vanguard anime has ever gotten to just being a traditional slice of life anime and I don't think that's bad honestly because again I think it does a really good job of Taking a deeper look at these characters, we've we've introduced the main three, Yu Yu, Danji, and Megami before now, like in the first three episodes, we kind of set up those characters quite a lot. And this episode was kind of taking a bit of a deeper look at each of the three, and I really enjoyed that. I will say one of the things I'm really looking forward to and have been looking forward to for a long time now is while seeing a proper introduction for the rest of the characters. We haven't really seen much of Izagaya, we haven't really seen much of Toya. Seto's been around here and there, but she hasn't really like done much. And the same thing kind of goes for Zakuza, although out of those characters, Zakuza is certainly the one who's done the most for sure. Like, you know, pilot a tank. We'll get to that bit in a sec, don't worry. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess before we fully get into it, I gotta remind you to like this video, comment on it with what you thought of the episode, both positive and negative, and be sure to subscribe if you want to see more of this stuff. Chances are, if you're watching a review for episode 4 of Overdress, that means you've either seen the previous ones or are just particularly like interested in this anime and want to see people's opinions of it and stuff and I have plenty of overdress videos coming up both for the card game and the anime so be sure to subscribe to see more of those and let's get kind of back into it so yeah yeah this was definitely a more character focused episode would I like to see card fights obviously I would love to see card fights but not every episode needs to have one obviously like I feel like there's a bit more pressure than usual for this series to have a car fight every episode just because of the fact that it's so short, you know, we only have 12 episodes before, you know, a season long hiatus, so the idea of like trying to fit as many car fights in there as possible could be very tempting, but I can appreciate their willingness and their patience to kind of step away and have a more character focused episode. Not that, you know, none of the car, none of the episodes so far have been particularly character focused, in fact they all have been, but the idea that not every episode needs to check off every box on a list, it makes it feel like this is a series that has kind of um, artistic merit to it. You, you know, like a lot of our shows, especially long running ones, in fact even previous episodes, Seasons of Vanguard, it felt like they were just going through it to kind of tick off a list. So in each episode, we gotta have this, we gotta have this, and we gotta have this, you know? And obviously, not every episode of the older Vanguard series has had a card fight, but those series were like ridiculously long. So having one episode here and there that didn't have one was fine. In fact, <laughs> funnily enough, now that I think about it, I feel like the original Vanguard did have a card fight in every episode. I can't remember. I'm. It doesn't really matter, I'm sure someone will go through and do the research for me there, but 
basically, I know for a fact Yu-Gi-Oh, for example, hasn't had, you know, a card fight in every, or a duel in every single episode. I know there are episodes of, like, Zaxel here and there that kind of uh, didn't have any at all. And I think that's fine. I think looking at a show like this, you need to kind of approach it from the point of view of, okay, what's the story we're trying to tell here? And does this episode benefit from card fights or not? The previous ones did. And in fact, I can kind of see why the previous episode had two card fights, because this one had none to kind of counterbalance it. Um, and obviously, I know people are going to want a card fight after, you know, having a full week hiatus. So it's like a lot of weeks now <laughs> that we've had no card fight. So I am hoping we do get a really cool card fight next week. Uh, but of course, you know, that's the thing. You got to take the show like as the right is a one in to give it to you i guess um you know i feel like a lot of people go into the show projecting their ideas of what they want to see from it but obviously if you go into the show with those kinds of expectations then that is very unfair because that's not really what's going to happen and obviously it makes it sound like i'm being very defensive but honestly no i i think that discussion is very interesting the idea that like well you know one of the things that people really did hype up when the show was first announced was the idea that it's not a card game advert anymore and so if we are allowed to go into the show hyping it up going it's not a card game advert anymore it's a proper like clamp kinema citrus anime now we got to go into it with the expectation the, the yeah, some episodes just aren't going to have car fights in. Uh, I, I took this screenshot here specifically because I wanted to compliment the anime's surprising use of Chekhov's gun. Uh, of course, most people watching will know this, but I guess I'd explain it for the uninitiated. Chekhov's gun is a movie writing, like, technique, a screenwriting rule, where basically if you show a gun in Act 1, it better go off in Act 3. And they used it here with the tank. And I wasn't expecting that. Obviously, we'd seen the tank in previous episodes and stuff too. I didn't think it was a real working tank. I will say that's probably something that might be a little bit divisive. Is the use of, like, uh, comedy. In fact, episode 2 was kind of a bit divisive because of its use of comedy as well. The, the comedy in this show is very, very over the top. And very, very nonsensical. It's very silly, but... I don't hate it, you know, I, I like these characters enough that seeing them be silly and goof off is fun. Y you know, I don't mind that. And honestly, I think it really, really helps the show. Because I think without those comedic moments and everything, the show could potentially be in danger of, like, having a bit too much of a downward tone for a show like this. I think counterbalancing it really works. In the V series, the, the reboot of Vanguard, I guess I bring that up every episode. <laughs> every episode I have to compare Overdress to the V series reboot, apparently. Um, but in that show, particularly like the AL4, like Foo Fighter arc near the beginning of the reboot, I felt like it hit this point where it was just like, too dark, like dour and serious. You had like Ren going around electrocuting people and characters talking about what like it really means to be a card fighter and all this other stuff. And there's like an episode where Kai like outright tells Aichi to throw his deck away and stop fighting. And I just hated that stuff. It, it felt a bit too like up its own ass. And I know there's an audience for that stuff, but like I feel it felt like too angsty. Whereas Overdress rides that line much nicer. I'm sticking on this screenshot here because this character, one of the things that I found very impressive with the writing of Overdress is that even the nameless background characters get some development. Uh, I mentioned previously that I really liked the back that Blackout had a lot of members uh, that kind of like filled out as background characters for lots of scenes and that they had like fairly memorable and like distinctive designs at least more memorable and distinct than background characters for these kinds of show usually get and so when they came back you kind of recognized them and this episode went a step further and gave this one here like he doesn't even have a name that i'm aware of he might have a name that was mentioned off screen like offhand or whatever but if it what if he does i didn't catch it 
but he has like an arc. At the beginning of the episode, he's very kind of jealous, similar to Megami in episode 2, where he's like, oh, Donji's giving all his attention to Yu Yu and everything, so he must be the cause of our problems. And then later on in the episode, he ends up like admitting that he's wrong and being kinder towards Yu Yu, and it's like, it's not a massive arc, it's not a revolutionary one, but the fact that it happens is crazy to me. You, you know, like, even the background characters get given something to do here. That's really, really cool. And, again, the fact that it is only a small little arc that's told over the course of, like, a couple of lines throughout the episode is even better because, of course, it doesn't take screen time away from the other more important characters. I really, really like that stuff. That stuff's very, very good. One of the biggest plot twists I've seen in an anime recently was just seeing how stupidly rich Megami is. Like, her house is absolutely massive. Like, this isn't Shion rich from G. This is, she could probably buy out whatever company Shion's family owns rich. Like, she is ridiculously wealthy. And that's kind of one of the things that this episode goes into, is the fact that that wealth was the thing protecting uh, the amusement park from being open and stuff. Now, by the end of the episode, Donji's in charge of it, and he's kind of taken over the burden of paying for all of, like, the bills and stuff regarding it. And we'll get into that in a bit more depth later. But it was very interesting. Like, it was a pretty big twist. Like, obviously, I wasn't expecting it to be, like, poor or anything, but I never considered that she'd be this well off. And I think it definitely adds a lot to her character and explains a lot of her previous interactions with how with how like she doesn't really like understand or at least she's not the best at interacting with people. She's very kind of um she's very kind of brash and she's very kind of defensive. And so the idea that she grew up in, like, a household with, like, maids and stuff would kind of explain that, yeah. And it would explain why she's so rebellious, too. So I really liked that stuff. I liked seeing uh, Takami, who we'll get into in a little bit. That was uh, her brother. Uh, so, yeah, we got Yu Yu being angsty and stuff. This scene was great. <laughs> I really liked that Yu Yu's family tried to attack Danji. <laughs> And then we cut to him, like, making dinner and everything for them. Uh, we get we got to see that one of Danji's jobs was, like, uh, a blowfish chef or whatever at, like, a Japanese restaurant. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know blowfish, I know this from the Simpsons episode, blowfish is one of the most difficult meals to prepare. You have to be incredibly precise when making it, so that goes to show just how talented Danji is. Uh, again... It's a really cool way of just using one little line here, a very natural sounding one too, to tell you a lot about a character. Uh, so he's very skilled at cooking too. Um, and then I liked, one of my favorite things, if not my favorite thing in this episode, was seeing the many interactions between Yu Yu and Danji. It was cool to see Yu Yu start pushing back against him. You know, like up until this point, Yu Yu has, well, found it very difficult to say no. And so he's kind of just gone along with everything that everyone's told him to do, including Danji. But in this episode, you definitely saw a lot of Yu Yu's concerns push through. Danji was very kind of carefree and everything in this episode, and Yu Yu was kind of starting to push back and be like, no, things aren't okay, we need to sort this out. And I really liked that. That was the best thing in this episode was seeing more interactions between those two. I definitely think those two characters are like the biggest strength of the series so far. And that's great because it's trying to be a character focused series. So if the best thing about the series is the characters, then it's doing something right, right? Uh, I really liked seeing that develop. I like seeing Danji turn into this sort of mentor character for Yu Yu. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that kind of turns out. Uh, yeah, I, I really like that. Of course, the main premise of the episode, the idea that Wonder Hill is at risk of being kind of torn down for demolition, it does end up being a nothing thing, you know? It ends up being one of those things where it was never really that big a problem in the first place. I kind of suspected that the moment we saw Megami's brother, the moment we saw him, I was like, all right, this isn't really going to be an issue. I feel like he's going to sort it out pretty quickly. And indeed he did. Uh, but just because the main characters 
Like, just because it didn't end up being that big an issue doesn't mean it didn't show us a lot about the main characters. Seeing Megami take this very kind of rebellious and responsible role against her brother like this was really cool to see. It showed us a lot about her character. It looks, it, it made her seem like a leader type character, even more so than Danji, honestly. And it also was, again, cool to see all of, like, the group sort of splinter off and fight amongst each other the moment Danji went missing for, like, a couple of days or so. Uh, that stuff was super interesting to see as well, and I think that is foreshadowing. Like, when you have an episode that overtly shows Danji going away to visit this temple or whatever, which I'll get to that in a sec, there's a lot to talk about, surprisingly. Uh, well, I should say unsurprisingly, but... Showing Danji go away for a fairly small amount of time and have the group already start panicking and falling out, that feels like foreshadowing. And of course, the fact that Danji outright tells Yu Yu that he thinks that Yu Yu has the potential that he himself couldn't achieve, again, that seems like foreshadowing. Something's gonna happen to Danji, and Yu Yu's gonna have to, like, become the leader, basically. Uh, kind of become the person that everyone else looks up to and I'm very interested to see that happen. Uh, another thing too was seeing Takami because Danji has a very offhand line where he references that he and Takami used to play Vanguard together and I'm very interested to see what happens with that because it seems like Takami may have been one of the original members of Blackout when Danji first founded it, hence why he helped keep Wanda Hill up and running. So, because that's the other thing too, right? If this episode didn't happen, people would probably eventually start asking, okay, how can they keep getting away with hanging out at Wanda Hill without anyone interfering? So having an episode focused on that was very good too, because it helps kind of, uh, it, it's a bit of world building, you know? A little, a little bit of world building goes a long way with this kind of thing. Shows that it's taking this sort of thing seriously, and they've actually fought through all this stuff. So I really liked seeing that stuff too. Uh, and again, I'm very interested to see what will come out of Takami being a card fighter. Maybe we will see him card fight in future, maybe in like season two or whatever. Uh, if so, I'm very excited to see what kind of deck he'll end up using. I guess my prediction is it'll probably be the Magus deck from Ke uh, Sanctuary. Because uh, no, none of the anime characters have claimed that deck yet. So I'm thinking it might be him. And the Cat Sanctuary kind of fits his aesthetic of being very posh and rich. Um, yeah, Danji has a tank. <laughs> I mean, I don't really know what to say about this scene. I thought it was funny. I thought it was cool and cute. Seeing, like, Zakuza go crazy on, like, the controls of the tank and everything. Obviously, again, I can definitely see and understand why some people would be taken out of the episode by such a silly joke. But I think having the silly jokes makes the characters more likable because you know it's just fun to see them goof around and stuff and it also again it helps create a more fun to watch tone even when they are dealing with these character focused topics i think it works i definitely think i'm going to go more in depth on my opinions on that kind of idea in a future episode review uh, as we get to see more of that kind of thing but i can definitely understand why some people would be put off by it for sure yes um, but yeah, I did think it was a very entertaining scene, though, for sure. I, I really liked it. Um, again, you could cinema sins ding the whole, like, but the tank really works? That's weird. I, and yeah, it is weird, but again, silly anime joke. It's okay, you know. Uh, this was the other thing I really wanted to get into. So, at least one of the theories from my theory video ended up being correct, and that was that Danji had a charm. First thought is the owner of the other half of the charm could be Takami. Since Danji did mention that the two of them used to card fight, maybe. It could also be the person from the shrine or whatever that was that Danji tried visiting earlier on in the episode. It's one of those two. I'm leaning more towards the shrine right now. And that could be Moray Monet. We'll see. I don't know. Uh, but I'm glad that... I was correct about um, Danji being the one to own the charm. Uh, I saw other people say it could be Zakuza, but I was kind of very, like, stagnant, like, a very stubborn that it was definitely Danji. And I was right. So that's at least one thing from that theory video that was correct. Basically, everything else seems to be very incorrect. 
<laughs> Remember when I thought that Takumi was Megami's abusive boyfriend? Yeah, that was wrong. Um, and, and yeah, it was really cool seeing these interactions between Yu Yu and Danji in their future. Seeing Danji be frustrated with his potential. Now see, the thing is, I am definitely going to have to see them elaborate on this more, right? Because the explanation Danji gave was a little confusing to me. And I think it's intentional. I do think you're supposed to be confused by Danji's motivations at this moment in time. Maybe once we learn more about the charm, more about his backstory, we'll kind of get a bit more of a of a look at an, an insight as to how his mind works. But basically, the explanation he gave to my understanding was that he felt like he couldn't reach the potential he needed to. And when he saw Yu Yu card fight and then card fighted him himself, he saw that spark and that potential in Yu Yu that he himself was missing. And that's why he wants to become the mentor for Yu Yu. And he wants to see Yu Yu become this figure that everyone else looks up to. Now, why is that? I guess we'll see, right? Uh, it could be straightforward and that he just wants Yu Yu to be good at card fighting. Or maybe there's something more going under the hood there, right? Uh, and it was really cool to see Yu Yu basically answer with like, I... I don't really understand everything that's happening, but I'm willing to keep card fighting if that's what you want me to do. So I'm very interested to see where they go with that. I do love the idea of Danji being this mental character. And again, I definitely feel like there's more going on with him because for card fighting to be such, you know, an important thing to him, such a, a hobby that he spends all his time with his friends doing, him giving it up seems pretty drastic. So I'm very interested to see uh, what the other kind of explanations are. And again, whether or not he will end up card fighting again, because he might, he might not. I don't know. Uh, and yeah, that was basically the episode. Those are my kind of very jumbled and all over there uh opinions overall though i really liked it you know i i liked it a lot i think as a standalone episode it might not be the most memorable of the four mainly because of the lack of a card fight but i think as a puzzle piece that slots into the rest of the series as a whole it's definitely going to play a really important part and i really liked seeing more of these characters and i definitely want to see more of them in future i am definitely wondering when like Toya and Seto and Zakuza and the others are going to get their card fights, I guess we'll see. Uh, but on the whole, I'm still, again, uh, I, I think I mentioned this at the beginning. Basically, I went into the episode with the thoughts of, I really like Overdress. So as long as episode 4 gives me more of the show I like, then I'm happy. And it did. And that's kind of the mindset I'm going to go into the show with from now on as well you know as long as it just gives me more of the show i like i don't really care as long as it isn't just going through the list and just checking off the box because it feels very formulaic when shows do that you know what i mean uh but other than that yeah i really really enjoyed the episode i really love seeing more of these characters and of course it goes about saying these are characters i really liked you know, I already feel quite the attachment to Danji. I already really like Yu Yu and so on and so forth. And of course, you know, your results may vary. You may not like, you may not care for the characters in the same way I do. And if so, this episode isn't going to hit quite as hard. So yeah, be sure to let me know what you thought of the episode in the comments below. Be sure to like the video if you found this uh, entertaining or interesting to listen to. And I'll see you later with more vanguard overdress videos in future be sure to subscribe if you want to see more of those of course remember for every statement there's always an asterisk one of these videos i'm going to forget to say that and i'll see you later with some more videos in future